So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maggie Bennington Davis. She's the Chief Medical Officer for HealthShare of Oregon, which is Oregon's largest coordinated care organization, or CCO. HealthShare coordinates physical, dental, and mental health benefits for 240,000 medical Medicaid enrolled Oregonians. In prior jobs and consultations, Maggie helped lead implementation of trauma-sensitive services. Maggie completed her MD and psychiatry residency at OHSU, where she remains on faculty. So please uh, welcome, help me welcome her. Thank you so much, and thanks for attending today, and thanks for inviting me to this conference. Um, I think the work that WIC and programs like yours are doing upstream with um, women and families and young children is really where the future of healthcare has to go, is where we're gonna wrap our arms around health and uh, also our budget, because the work, the investing you do in families really pays off much later on. So I wanna start by um, getting your brains working a little bit. Um, and so I want you just to take a minute and think about um, how present you are in this moment. So how, what percent of your brain is um, here and learning and listening and what percent of your brain is back home or worrying about the flat tire you've got out in the parking lot or the cat that ran away or your kid that um, was in a fight with you this morning or one of your clients who's really struggling. So when you think of the percent that you're present, whether it's 70% or 100% or 10%, I just want you to think of that number. And once you've got your number, I'm gonna to count to three, and on the count of three, I just want you to say your number. So nobody's gonna to listen to just you, I just want you to say it out loud on the count of three. One, two, three. Excellent. So that was really a clever of me because by doing that, I actually got more of your attention. I increased the percentage of points in the room just by having you go through that exercise. And I do that as um, one kind of manifestation of how once you really you start to grasp the neurobiology of how a person's thinking works, then you can start to play with it a little bit and bring people to become more present with you and more able to learn from you and connect with you, which is really, in the end, what trauma-informed care is all about. So I'm gonna talk a lot today about you know, how the brain works, the neurobiology of exposure to toxic stress and so forth. And sometimes this is really difficult material. It's, um, sometimes just kind of painful to think about because, um, and as you know, people sometimes have really hard lives and come from really tough places. Once in a while, this material can be sort of triggering in an unexpected way, even for the people who are learning and listening. So I want you to take another, like, 20 seconds and just think in your own head, okay, if I happen to get triggered today, what's my game plan? And I want to let you know that your game plan can be anything you want it to be. You can tune out, you can pick up a pen in front of you and start doodling. It's a great way to tune out, by the way. Um, you're welcome to um, stand up and leave. I, I certainly understand um, how that works. Um, you might want to, if you if you're think, well, it might get kind of rough, um, you might say to the person next to you, if you're sitting near a friend or somebody you trust, say, if I tap you, will you come out with me? So I just want you to think, whatever your own internal game plan is, um, just think for a few seconds about, hmm, what, will, what would I do? So go ahead, I'm just gonna be silent for a few seconds. So a friend of mine once, when I asked him what, I, I knew I was heading into a rough few days and I said, Steve, you, you always seem to kind of have life handled. How do you do that? How do you prepare for a rough few days? And he told me that he always, um, at the beginning of each day, he picks three words. And he tries to rotate himself around those three words all day long, especially when he starts to feel frustrated or upset. 
So I adopted that practice from him many years ago, and I have a little sign in my car, so when I get in my car and I'm driving to work in the morning, um, it says choose three words, and I always think, okay, three words. So I want to let you know that my three words today are kindness, joy, and patience. And so if I stop for a second in the middle of presenting, it's because I'm sort of recentering myself. It's another part of being trauma-informed is to be able to re regulate yourself even when stress is very, very high. And in fact, when, we, when a lot of people talk about being trauma-informed, we're often thinking about the people we're serving. But really the essence of being trauma-informed is being able to regulate ourselves in such a way is that everybody around us feels better. And that, for me, is the um, kind of manifestation of being trauma-informed. So, you see my slide here, and it is, um, it says the neurobiology of kindness. It's because after doing maybe thousands of these talks on tra being trauma-informed, I got tired of seeing the word trauma in all my title <laughs> slides. And so um, I was doing a Grand Rounds once in Reno, Nevada, University of Nevada, and this guy comes up to me afterwards. He says, you know, you really ought to retitle your talk to the neurobiology of kindness. And so I accepted his um, proposal, and there it is. But in fact, geez, there we go. Um, but in fact, this talk is about trauma, and trauma is a big deal. Um, and it's actually been a known in our culture ever, actually the first person that's known to have written about this was Aristotle. So for thousands of years we've known the impact of um, being in overwhelming circumstances um, for, you know, maybe since humankind. Um, but more recently it really came into being following World War II and um, descriptions of shell shock, that was one of the first, um, first labels of it, and then uh, really came into its science mess um, following the Vietnam War. But we're just finding more and more and more that um, trauma plays a huge role in how we're wired, how we view the world, and how we treat each other. And I'm going to read this slide because um, there are a lot of words on it. So we serve people exposed to trauma, violence, and overwhelming chronic stress, particularly exposure as children, that affects their neural or their brain development. And these experiences that people have had call forth a range of responses, including the easy triggering of the fight, flight, freeze response, intense feelings of fear, loss of trust in others, chronic hypervigilance, a decreased sense of personal safety, feelings of guilt and shame, and difficulty engaging in the way we have traditionally administered both social services and healthcare services. And that's why trauma is a big deal. It's because we have lots of good resources for people, but have you ever had taken all of your great resources to a family and just not been able to have them connect to them? That barrier between what we have to offer and what people can take is probably because we haven't figured out a service delivery system that, that builds enough trust for people to be able to um, take advantage of what we have to offer. All right, whoops. This computer and I are not getting along very well. It's okay. I've got it. It's okay. I'll just use different buttons. This is kind of a icky slide, isn't it? <laughs> See, I told you you might get triggered. <laughs> so what really one of the main themes I want to um, leave you with today is that this idea of tr toxic stress, even though we all are stressed all the time about something or other, this idea of overwhelming toxic stress is, has, takes much more of a toll than uh, we have talked about even as a society. And in, our, uh, in, the, in, in my world, in the Medicaid world, we know that well over three quarters of um, the people who are receiving Medicaid have had these 
overwhelming toxic exposures during childhood. And I keep repeating that phrase during childhood because exposure to toxic stress in adulthood has a little bit different impact than exposure during childhood, and that's because during childhood, brains are growing at a much faster rate, and I'm actually gonna go into that in some detail. But I wanted to start with the definition just for today of what I mean when I talk about trauma. One of my best friends is a trauma surgeon at Emanuel Hospital, and she gives me a hard time all the, all the time about, she says, Maggie, when you say trauma, it's really different than when I say trauma. So I wanna, um, I'm gonna use Bessel van der Kolk's. He's a psychiatrist on the East Coast who has done a lot of work um, about uh, historical trauma and the way our bodies feel after that exposure to toxic stress in childhood. This is my favorite definition. Traumatization occurs when both internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with external threat. And I like that definition because it means it's in the eye of the behold. It's in the, it's in the definition of the person experiencing it. I don't get to say whether it's traumatic for you or not. Only you know when your resources have been so overwhelmed that you feel your life is in peril. And uh, when I went to medical school, the definition of trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder came from us, the practitioners. We got to be the judge about, well, is that traumatic enough to fit the definition <laughs> of PTSD? And so I really like Bessel's um, definition here because it puts the definition in the person who's experiencing it. And of course, if you use that definition, start to understand that the traumatic impact then depends on a lot of things. What might be traumatic to me today, because I've had a great night's sleep last night, everything's going okay at home, my, work, my job is going okay, my relationships are intact, I have a lot more space to tolerate really bad things happening to me today, even though I hope none do than I would have if a lot of those things were not in place. And so the context matters a lot. It matters if it's single or repeated. It certainly matters at what age. What is overwhelming to one's resources at age two is different than what is overwhelming um, at age 10. And so there are a lot of things that matter here in this definition, and I wanted to call that out although I'm not gonna walk through um, the stages and ages in detail. I just wanted to let you know that I'm aware that context matters. I also wanna give a definition of trauma-informed services, because that's been talked about a lot. And although there are federal definitions, and probably Oregon has a definition too, this one is my favorite. This comes from our um, friends across the border in Canada, British Columbia. Trauma-informed services take into account an understanding of trauma in all aspects of service delivery and place priority on the individual's safety, choice, and control. Such services create a treatment culture of nonviolence, learning, and collaboration. Using a trauma-informed approach does not require disclosure of trauma. That's really important to this talk as well. I'm not gonna send you guys out of here with the feeling you have to be expert clinicians in order to elicit stories of trauma um, because that is not required in order to be trauma-informed. Rather, it means that services are provided in ways that recognize the need for physical and emotional safety as well as choice and control in decisions affecting one's services. Trauma-informed practice is more about the overall essence of the approach or way of being in a relationship than a specific treatment strategy or method. So here's where the neurobiology part starts. I'm gonna walk you through brain development a little bit. Anybody in here have an infant in their lives, in their homes? Or, yeah, got a couple of infants in here. Okay, so here's what's going on. When babies are born, Their brain stem, so the part of the brain that is right at the base of your neck, is fully formed. And that part of the brain makes sure the heart is beating and the lungs are breathing and the appetite is working, those sorts of very basic things. 
but the thinking part of the brain, the part that's up here, is not yet formed. And the reason for that is because if we had babies with fully formed brains at the get-go, well, you women in the room would know how painful that would be to deliver that baby with a fully formed brain. So in order to let the baby out, something had to give, and it's that higher order thinking and learning processes that do not start to form until after birth. However, once birth has been accomplished and the baby is out, then the brain just grows like wildfire. It grows extremely quickly, especially in those first few years. The slide shows you that, um, and, and when, when brain cells in the thinking part of the brain um, develop, what they're doing is they're growing and connecting with other brain cells. That's how thinking occurs. It's not in a given cell, but it's how brain cells connect to other brain cells. And you can see that there are 700 new connections per second going on after birth. That's how quickly those brains are developing. And the most rapid development is in those first few years, but the fact is fairly rapid development continues until our early 20s. And um, again, when I keep repeating about toxic stress exposure during childhood, it's because of this rapid brain development. And what happens during those first couple of decades matters a lot to how that development goes. So this is another way of looking at it. So in the, when the baby is first born, those, those thinking brain cells in what's called the frontal cortex, there aren't very many of them. But they begin to proliferate extremely rapidly. I almost think of it like a field of wildflowers just um, suddenly blooming and growing. And then through the experiences that a child has during those years, Certain of those brain connections that are happening, those 700 connections per second that are happening, persist and wind up forming patterns. And the ones that don't get used very much wind up getting weeded out. So if you imagine my wildflower garden and you decide all you want in there are California poppies and you weed out everything else, you wind up with this very nice organized field of California poppies. And that's sort of how this brain development works. And that's why as um, parents, we often sort of intuitively know it's really helpful to have rituals and patterns with our kids, same bedtime every night, same meal time all the time, do homework at the same time. Um, but that comes to us naturally, and it turns out that's because what we're trying to do, even if we're not neuroscientists, is we're trying to help our children's brains get organized into patterns. And those patterns later on is what we call personality. But actually that is forming um, through experiences that is, a child is having throughout their lives. So as you're sitting there, I want you to think, hmm, that means that we can really shore up patterns that are healthy and good for the person and help them with things like emotional management and logic and kindness, patience, and joy. Or if a person is in a lot of toxicity, a lot of toxic stress during that time, those patterns might start to look different. And it's that basic understanding that is helpful um, as we take on this idea of trauma-informed services. So whether you are a nature person or a nurture person, when I was in medical school, we had this huge debate. What percent of people are made up of their genes and what percent is made up of their interactions with the environment? And um, obviously the answer is both. But what we do know is that that interaction with the environment is far more profound during childhood than we ever imagined. Because the brain, most of the brain, the thinking part of the brain, is developing in the environment and in rhythm with the environment, whether that's good or bad. And so most of higher order thinking is a result of exposure during childhood to what, whatever that exposure is. I'm going to try showing this video. This is going to be very tricky here. Let's see if we can do it. It's only about three minutes long. Have so, you ever seen that video before? A few people in here 
you have. And so I often think about the work that you all do and the families that you interact with and how stressed those families are and how frequently um, you know, people feel too overwhelmed to be able to respond um, to their growing infants. And understanding that this, this, the neural development that's going on in those interactions is crucial for a later healthy um, individual. So there's a um, kind of a special way of special um, way of thinking about this, and that's attachment trauma. That the inability of a mom or a parent or a caregiver to attach to to provide an environment for their infant to attach in those early days is probably one of the biggest sources of later on problems um, than we could ever come up with in terms of a list of the biggest issues. And so it turns out that those early attachments are probably a prerequisite in a lot of ways for um, future normal brain development. So this is a stress continuum. So, I mean, we all have stress all the time, and some stress is good stress, right? When when there's a deadline coming up and you know you have to study for it and it kind of motivates you. So the kind of stress that is motivating is called positive stress. The kind of stress that we probably live with a lot that doesn't exactly motivate us but it doesn't kill us either um, is tolerable stress. And that's probably a pretty frequent form of stress in all of our lives. But then in the next categories it starts to get um, into the toxic and traumatic realm, where it's just overwhelming. If we go back to Bessel's definition of trauma, when your internal and external resources are inadequate to cope, now you're getting into a toxic stress situation. And I want to draw your attention to the, um, that top bar that says allostatic load, because I'm gonna circle back to that in a few slides and define that um, a little bit further. But basically, allostatic load means, so, so I want you to uh, step away from the slide for a minute. Instead, think in your own bodies when you're under a lot, a lot, a lot of stress. So imagine a time when that's been true for you. Can you start to feel it in your body? You feel you're kind of your, Stomach, at least for me, my stomach tenses up, my lungs feel constricted, my throat feels a little bit constricted, usually my heart rate's a little bit elevated. I just don't feel very good. And that's because uh, with that kind of heightened um, stress, your body is actually releasing a whole boatload of chemicals that are meant to protect you from the tiger that's what stress originally was meant to do, is say, whoa, danger, you have to fight for your life. But in our modern world, it, we have all those same chemical reactions, but they don't really help. And in fact, they are pretty damaging. And that idea of having all those hormones turned on for a long period of time is called allostatic load. Okay, let me come back to that. So this is what I was talking about. All these chemicals are released when we're under a lot of stress that have really an impact on almost every single part of your body. And as a physician, I could probably walk you through which chemicals do which of these, but that doesn't matter as much as you understand that these cascades of hormones and chemicals, um, do they shut your gut down, they increase your heart rate, they dilate your um, certain ve blood vessels. So all these things happen that actually shut down your immune system. And the way to think about it is think, okay, if the tiger really is here and about to get you, um, what your body has evolved to, to do is figure out, well, what do I need right now and what don't I need? So it turns up the volume, like getting blood and sugar to your muscles so you can run and fight but it turns off all these other things. Because if you're about to get you know, eaten by a tiger, your immune system does not need to work. Because you know, if you're eaten, it doesn't do you any good. And so all the resources that normally would go to that get shut off, and instead the resources are all pushed to what will save you in that moment. 
So that's the way to think about this particular diagram. I'm gonna walk you through what happens in the brain under kind of terrifying stress or an acute threat, um, and then what happens in uh, chronic threat. So this is a very simple diagram that should obviously leaves out a whole bunch of other parts of the brain, but these are the key parts in fight, flight, and freeze. And I assume people are pretty familiar with that idea that you know, when you're about to get eaten by a tiger, you have certain um, responses, fight, flight, or freeze. So the, the parts here, there's the amygdala. You see the amygdala in the little red circle. The amygdala is very interesting. It's fully formed and functioning at birth. That's one of the first things for you to know. And it's basically this kind of on-off switch for sensing whether you're in danger or not. So we're born with that. We're born with the on-off switch to know what's dangerous. And for an infant, for a newborn, what's dangerous are things like a hunger pang. Because as a newborn, you can't get food by yourself. You're dependent on others. So if you have a hunger pang, you scream. Um, because that's what, you know, you, that's really one of the only recourses you have. Or if you feel a breeze on your skin, you scream because as a newborn, you can't protect yourself from cold. And so you do what you can to um, react to these things that could be life-threatening. Fully functioning, formed at birth, and we still have it today. Our amygdalas work really well. They're very tuned in to what's dangerous and what's not. The hippocampus, which is in the middle there, is, it does a lot of things, and it's one of the earliest forms of memory that we have. It is not formed at birth, but it starts to form right after birth, and it starts to function pretty well by about age four months, and by about age nine months or so, um, it's functioning almost fully, and then it's fully functioning by about two. And I think of it as a short-term filing cabinet. So the hippocampus is this you know, you see something um, as an infant, you're, you're exposed to maybe mom or dad or familiar things or your, your crib. Um, and at first, there's no memory for that. But as that hippocampus starts to form, it begins to kind of recognize in a short-term way what it's, the environment is all about. And in a lot of ways, it's our centering ability to center, okay, this is an okay place to be. So, brand new infant has the hunger pang, screams, and gets fed. By about three or four months, as the hippocampus starts to form, has the same hunger pang, the amygdala still says, whoa, this is a problem. But by now, the hippocampus is able to say, well, wait a minute, I see mom, I see the bottle, whatever, and that infant begins those early abilities to self-soothe, given what they know about the situation, and wait a little bit. So those of you who have raised babies, you can remember that by about that age, three or four months, that you can actually jiggle the baby a little bit and get them to not ab absolutely melt down. And you think it's because you've uh, you know, honed your skills as a parent, which I'm sure you have. <laughs> but really what's happening is that hippocampus is growing and developing, so the baby is able to take on external stimuli that, stimuli that say, it's okay, it's going to be okay. Um, and so it's, uh, it's sort of a reassuring part of the system. And then the cortex is that frontal cortex part I've been talking about, this high-level thinking part of the brain. And it's the part that, you know, knits in everything you've ever been taught, everything you can imagine, your higher-level um, uh, executive functioning skills. So uh, let me give a little example. Right now, if I did something really annoying, like slapped the microphone really hard unexpectedly, can you imagine you might jump a little bit, go whoop, that was your amygdala saying, whoa, wake up. And your hippocampus immediately kicks in and says, well, yeah, amygdala, I heard it too. But I am in a safe room. I'm in, you know, a, what seem to be fairly nice people are around me. And Maggie doesn't seem all that dangerous. So I think it's okay. And then your cortex, furthermore, 
says, and it would be kind of rude to shout out remarks to Maggie or to um, uh, react in any way, so I'm just going to ignore all of that and sit here and be civilized. So all those things work together in such a way that I can get away with a fair amount up here as long as you don't feel like you're, as long as your hippocampus doesn't feel like you're in danger. <coughs> However, if what we hear is perhaps a gunshot outside the door, all those bets are off, right? The amygdala fires just like it did when I hit the microphone. But this time your hippocampus says, you know, I got nothing for you here. There's nothing about this situation that is reassuring. And in fact, all I know about that is that that's a problem. Your cortex really kind of says, you know, don't look at me, I think too much. <laughs> what I need to do is, you know, take an amygdala and fight flee or freeze. And so that's how all of that works. Very nice system. However, if this baby in the still face experiment, it grows up in years and years of this allostatic load, this turn on spigot of stress hormones, which also affects the developing brain, then that cortex doesn't grow or develop quite as fully as we would want it to. And so um, as that child, if they're not rescued, as the narrator on the, the videotape said, um, then the cortex does not grow as robustly as we would want. And furthermore, if things are stressful enough, the hippocampus doesn't grow as robustly or fully as we would want either. So now when you stare at this cartoon and you think of me hitting the microphone really hard, unexpectedly, the amygdala fires as it does, but the hippocampus is a little less able to recognize a safe and familiar environment. And so it's less able to um, give alternatives to the human. And the cortex is not quite as able to manage those impulses or to use its high level executive function to calm things down. And so in that circumstance, this particular person is gonna react much more dramatically to much lower level stimuli. Any of you ever met this person? Yeah. One of the hallmarks of um, that last cartoon is the phenomenon of hypervigilance. We've all experienced hypervigilance in moments, but n probably not too many of us in this room live with it every minute of every day. But people who have been exposed to extraordinary toxic stress throughout their early childhoods with no rescuing, as in the still face experiment, um, actually evolve with that final cartoon of the brain that I showed you um, with this chronic hypervigilance. There is a really interesting experiment um, done where there is person like me standing up here and looking at a bunch of people like you and Click took a picture. And on those people's faces, if I were to show the picture um, to maybe you all, just to a crowd of people and say, what do those faces say? People would say, well, they look serious, they look like they're concentrating, they look, um, you know, intrigued, they, that one looks kind of friendly, um, and so forth. But if you show the same exact picture to someone who's either in an acute hypervigilant state, as we've all been, or lives in a chronic hypervigilant state, the faces are interpreted completely differently. They're interpreted as, that one is being judgmental of me, that one is criticizing me, that one is actually, um, looks like they're gonna attack me. Um, and, and that one looks, you know, like they're, um, you know, gonna bully me. So the interpretation of the exact same things are way to the extent of being fearful of them, being, felt, feeling like, um, you know, something bad's gonna happen to me. Now, as a psychiatrist, 
Um, you know, uh, we had a class in school where we learned how to go, hmm, tell me more. We didn't really, but we kind of did. You know, where you, you learn how to, well, you want to be this kind of um, deadpan face so people will be able to project onto you or whatever. This is a long time ago. Hopefully they don't train this anymore. But, you know, I got really good at going, hmm, hmm. And when I started learning about this phenomenon, I thought, hmm, hmm. And I realized that my psychiatrist persona was actually absolutely terrifying to a lot of the people I was working with because they were in this hypervigilant state and, and they, you know, they felt like I was an aggressor or I was judgmental or I was critical. And so I actually worked with a coach and a mirror to change my persona, to change my face in order to not come across as terrifying, even though, um, you know, I thought I was just being a good psychiatrist. Okay, here's where we ask for volunteers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know this crowd very well, but I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> Not what's going on. These mice, or these rats, rather, are playing. Um, and the top slide is how rats initiate play with each other. One rat will jump on the back of another one and say, hey, let's play, and off they go. These are lab rats, by the way. I don't think that field rats necessarily play too much. But these lab rats, they jump on the back, they say, hey, let's play. They run around, and then um, at some point, they might get into this bottom position, which is called a pin, where one rat momentarily holds the bottom rat helpless, just for a minute. Um, while they're wrestling around. And that's, the scientists call that a vulnerable play position. And so this, uh, this guy, Dr. Panksef, did this experiment where he measured how often these lab rats played with each other, initiated play, that top position, and then during the course of play, how often they got into the vulnerable play position. And the top graph here is that play initiation and, and the dark, the solid line shows basically how these um, rats played very consistently throughout the um, lab period. And you can see that it's, you know, it's a pretty steady line. And the bottom graph is that pinning, that vulnerable play position. And, and the dark line is, you can see that it's a little more jagged and it's a little less frequent because it's a subset of overall play. And then what Dr. Pankset did was inserted a single cat hair into the cage. Single cat hair went into the cage. And that's that dotted line. And you can see where the cat hair was inserted because play stopped. Stopped entirely. And obviously if play initiation stops, then the pinning play stops as well. He left it in there for 24 hours. And during that time, there was no rat interaction at all. They, the rats just stayed in their corners and didn't interact with each other. And then he pulled the cat hair out, and gradually in the top graph, that dotted line, you can see that play comes back, right? Play initiation comes back, and then look where it levels off. And you statisticians in the room can see that it levels off at a statistic statistically lower level than it was before, and it stays that way for the rest of the rat lives, never achieves back at that former level. And that, look at that bottom graph, this vulnerable play position essentially goes away. It essentially goes away. It looks like it comes back a little bit, but statistically, that behavior goes away, that vulnerable play position. So I'm, I'm not um, suggesting that you know, human brains can be compared to rat brains, but for me, this is a stunning example of how we are fundamentally, as, as organisms, as living organisms, we are fundamentally changed by this exposure to danger. And I also think about this, I use it as a sort of metaphor in my own head, when I notice, as a psychiatrist, when I notice that sometimes people aren't engaging with the services I so desperately want to offer them, I think, hmm, I wonder where the cat hair is in the system. Where's the cat hair in the system that is between me and what the work I'm trying to do? I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit and uh, talk about what our bodies do during fight, flight, freeze. And um, 
probably you all would have guessed right if I said when the gunshot goes off, it's the very first thing that happens in your body. And it turns out the very first thing that happens is your heart rate goes up. It's the very first thing that happens. So our heart rates are very tuned in to our environment, or the environment of danger. And there is this psychologist who died back in the 1980s, but his name was Lawrence Kohut. Anybody in here old enough to study Lawrence Kohut? Probably not. And he was a little obscure because he said kind of um, hard to understand things. Although when you repeated what he said, it made you feel very smart and, and uh, you know kind of highbrow um, because no one understood you either, and you didn't understand it. But you didn't <laughs> put that part on. But he used to say things like, "When you see the tiger, do you run because you're afraid, or are you afraid because you run?" And when he said that, people said, oh, wow, well, that sounds important, but I don't know what it means. But it turns out <laughs> he was onto something. Because it turns out that just your body's, your physiologic reaction to a situation, which might even happen before your brain registers it fully, kind of lets your brain know, whoa, there's something wrong here. So that elevated heart rate can, in and of itself, spur or trigger the fight, flight, freeze reaction. I, you know, I don't know if I'm offending any hockey fans, but my son taught me this funny little saying that when you go to a, you know, you go to a hockey fight and wait for a match to break out. <laughs> so, um, and, and it's true that athletes, when they're in the, in the moment, you know, basketball players, football players, when they're just fully in the moment and something goes wrong, they get into these fights right on the field. And some of that might be show, but a lot of it is this whole thing is that they're just physiologically, they're just so revved up that re really overtakes um, one's normal ability to think. So this guy named Ari Shalev, um, who is now at Harvard, but he used to be at Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem, he studied this, and he studied it in an emergency department where uh, um, survivors of suicide bombings would come in. And they were a little bit revved up when they came into the ER. Their heart rates were high, their blood pressure was high, their respirations were high. And he did this sort of naturalistic study where he looked, if, those, if the people um, who came in like that were able to be physiologically calmed down before they left the ER, it turned out they did pretty well in terms of being able to re-engage with their lives and jobs and families and so forth. Um, and they didn't develop post-traumatic stress disorder, but people who were still physiologically highly aroused um, were very vulnerable to developing um, acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and had all sorts of problems kind of re-entering their lives and their jobs and so forth. So yeah, Ari's... Um, uh, publications on that were so profound that Harvard Medical School invited him uh, to Boston where he continued those experiments and with a guy named Roger Pittman who was on 60 Minutes a few years ago if you happen to catch that. But he did this study of, um, uh, of people who were on bicycles in Boston who had been hit by a car but not killed and who were in the ER, came in pretty revved up, and they got all the usual treatment that they would get in that circumstance, but he also offered them just a heart blocking medication, propranolol, which just, it just blocks how high your heart rate can go. That's what it did. And, the, and it turned out that the people who took that heart blocking drug did better in not developing post-traumatic stress disorder and other sequelae of what had happened to them compared to people whose heart rates were out of control. So the, the moral of this story is that we not only can kind of mess around a little bit with cat hair for people's brains, but we can also start to think about, hmm, how can we mess around with heart rates a little bit? And it turns out that I'm really good at increasing people's heart rates. <laughs> All I have to do is come and just get really close to you, look at you, tower over you, act like I might ask you to take the microphone. I mean, sorry, thank you. <laughs> so I'm pretty good at that, and I don't even have to try. In fact, it comes pretty naturally. But if I want to be a different kind of provider, and I say to myself, okay, my whole goal here today is to help 
keep your heart rate low. Everything about me changes. First of all, look at just unconsciously, I start backing up. I give a little bit more space that my knees are starting to bend because I'm gonna get down more on your level. I can only bend that far. Um, I'm gonna be much more careful with my eye contact. I'm gonna make eye contact, but I'm not gonna like make eye contact. <laughs> so I'm gonna be pretty careful. My voice starts to change, it starts to lighten, it starts to soften. Everything about me starts to change. And that all happened unconsciously. But what if I could make that conscious? What if I could remember that one of my goals is to decrease your heart rates um, when I interacted with you, now I'm starting to get trauma informed. I'm starting to actually change how I am and how I interact with you in order to use your physiology and your ability to keep yourself controlled in order for things to go well between us. So my husband always says there are two kinds of people in the world, the kind of people who think there are two kinds of people and the kind of people who are, don't. So um, anyway, there's two kinds of coping. And maybe some of you have been watching this and saying, well, wait a minute, I had a huge allostatic load when I was a kid and I'm okay. Or I work with a lot of families under huge allostatic load, but they're doing pretty good. What about resilience? Well, it turns out that there are two kinds of coping in the world. There's maladaptive coping and there's adaptive coping. And the important thing here is to think back to that still face experiment video and understand that all, we still don't know a lot about resilience, we're still working on that. But everything that we're, we've learned so far about resilience has to do with a healthy connection in the context of relationship. Human beings are group animals. We are born to love. And um, if we can find those connections, if our brains early in our development can find some connections, and we will seek them wherever we can find them. If we can't get them from our mom, we will look elsewhere. And so if it's available anywhere, humans will adapt in a good way, um, but it has to be in the context of relationships. And I think about that all the time in our work, work like yours. You might be that person. You might be the healthy relationship that allows a person to use their adaptive coping skills. And then of course there's maladaptive coping, and I suspect you guys have seen it all. But you know, certainly substance use disorders, um, phobias, avoidance, um, self-harming behavior, depression, suicidality, all the, uh, you've seen all of these things. And these are the sequelae of what happens um, after being in a world of toxic stress with no, um, no resources. And so the people that we serve have had, if you serve like we do, people um, who are enrolled in Medicaid, have had tremendous exposure to toxic stress, to high allostatic load, particularly during childhood, that causes this wash of threat detection all the time, this hypervigilance all of the time. And those are the folks that we're interacting with. And so those of us who serve them have developed our own hypo hypotheses about what's going on. Some of us might completely get all of this and say, oh, I get what's going on. They're scared, or the system's been bad to them, or they've had really tough um, exposures. Or sometimes we might think, wow, they're really you know, uncooperative, or um, uh, they're, you know, they're rejecting my help, or whatever. But part of being trauma-informed is bringing that to consciousness and kind of tapping into what are your own reactions and what are your assumptions. Here are the things that we often see. These are um, flags that, oh, this may be the, what we're, um, what, what's going on here is this exposure to high allostatic load during childhood. Disengagement, the sort of shut down thing. Um, aggression or loss of impulse control, particularly if something new happens. Um, very quick deterioration into power and control struggles. Even though you weren't trying to take power control, it kind of turns into a power struggle. Any of you ever found yourself in a power struggle that you really didn't ask for? It's like, well, it just happens. 
Um, aggression and fear in the context of just trying to follow the rules or rule enforcement. And then little things precipitating kind of big reactions, sort of like hitting the microphone type of thing. And at least in psychiatry, we've developed a whole book full of diagnoses to try to explain this to ourselves. Personality disorders, depression, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, and on and on and on. But really, when you think about it, these labels are not helpful. These are not helpful to this particular situation. And so Dr. Sandy Bloom, now rather famously, and lots of people have borrowed this now, has said, you know, we've got to change the essential question. It's not what's wrong with you. It's not what's your diagnosis. It's not what's wrong with you. It really has to shift in our own thinking to, hmm, what has happened to this person? So um, these next few slides are about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Can I see a show of hands of who's familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? About probably a quarter of the room. So this is a very important study that was um, published in 1998 by authors Dr. Felitti and Anda. And doctors, these were two um, docs that were not psychiatrists. One is an endocrinologist and the other is an epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control. And they wanted to understand why some people, um, actually it started in a weight loss clinic, um, that Rob Anda was running, and he wanted to know why some people did really well uh, in this weight loss clinic, and other people, they would start to do really well, and then they would either drop out of treatment or go backwards, and he was curious about that. Dr. Politi, meanwhile, was studying actually tobacco use and having some of the same experiences, so they put their heads together and said, well, why don't we explore a little bit more about people? And they did this huge study of about 18,000 people in the San Diego area um, who were Kaiser Permanente members. So they were mostly white, middle class adults who had had some college education in their 50s and 60s. And uh, they basically did a questionnaire and they said, um, basically, they said, what happened to you? The questionnaire is 10 questions, pretty simple. It's yes or no to 10 questions, so the score is one point for a yes and zero points for a no, so you can have anywhere from zero to 10 points. There are three categories of questions and 10 questions. And the abuse questions are basically, between the ages of zero and 18, did you experience physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, one, two, three. Um, same thing with neglect. When, between the ages of 0 and 18, did you experience, then you can fill in the blanks there. And then household dysfunction was um, when, between the ages of 0 and 18, um, in your household, was there someone with symptomatic mental illness? Was there domestic violence? Was there um, substance use in the house? So that's not you as a person, that's in your house. And, um, and again, the answers were yes or no for 10 questions. But the results just stunned Dr. Spillini and Anda, because what they found, even in this white, middle-class, college-educated San Diego bunch of people, that two-thirds had experienced at least one of those things, and um, a vast majority had experienced two or more. So that was the first time we really started to understand that first snaky slide that I showed about the prevalence of toxic stress in our society and in our world was huge. But the, as they studied their data, and here's the disturbing part, they found that there was a direct linear correlation between that number, that zero to 10 number, and then incidence of chronic physical conditions and earlier death um, in adulthood. And so score of zero, you're probably going to be fine, look to a ripe old age. Um, and then as you add up the scale, the chances of you having chronic, chronic physical conditions, chronic mental conditions, addictions issues, and other high risk health behaviors goes up and up and up, with one of the tipping points being around a score of about four. They also noted that adverse childhood experiences were linked 
to most of the top 10 causes of death in the United States. Now that's an astonishing statement to make. You can't look at these top 10 causes and really give me one other link among all of these things. But adverse childhood experiences is indeed a link for all of these things. So they thought, wow, we're on to something. And basically what they were on to is this idea of allostatic load. That, and by the way, there's nothing magical about those <coughs> 10 questions that they asked. That happened to be the 10 questions that they chose. But you can look at, and in fact, many places have Philadelphia has adapted the ACE questionnaire now to be an urban inner city questionnaire, things like community violence racism, sibling violence, you probably can create your own list of what should be on that ACE questionnaire. So the question, there's nothing magic about those particular questions. Really the magic is to tap into, oh, this produces high allostatic load, that high turning on of those stress hormones and chemicals over long periods of time during childhood when your body and your brain are developing. And that's what Felidia and Anda have tapped into in their Adverse Childhood Experiences study. I just wanted to mention that at HealthShare, um, we uh, looked at people, so all Medicaid members, we looked at people who were the highest cost, highest using members um, at HealthShare, and did sort of a version, of an adult version of the Adverse um, Childhood Experiences that we called Adverse Life Events and said, basically gave people a blank timeline and said, what's happened to you? What has happened to you throughout your lives? And people filled that out. And what we heard were things like uh, Miranda's story here. You know, what we found were high, high um, percentages of people who were born, in, born to parents who weren't ready for them, often teen parents, parents who themselves were maybe using substances or were homeless or living in poverty or have a lot of domestic violence. Um, these folks were in and out of foster child system, often weren't um, you know, really ready for kindergarten or even enrolled in kindergarten, didn't have a good success in school, started using substances themselves, often turned into teen parents themselves. You know the story, you guys live the story with the people that you serve all of the time. And so that we replicated basically what the adverse childhood experience had st um, shown us but we took it even further because we know that this doesn't stop at age 18, right? The stress continues and turns into sort of a life cycle of its own. And so what we found was that between ages of zero and six, there was um, high incidence of physical and sexual abuse and certainly neglect. Between the ages of seven, 19, there's at least half of people had dropped out of school um, a lot of you know, kind of um, running away and um, losing contact with parents. And then the adversity goes on from ages 19 to 30, more in car you know, incarceration, drug use, and so on and so forth. And so this idea of adverse childhood experiences starting something that is really hard to stop um, is really important. So what we found at HealthShare was that, wow, as you think about development throughout childhood as a upward tra trajectory to achieve adulthood with a good education, um, a good job, and good family relationships, there are lots of places to fall off <laughs> that trajectory. And as a, a system, as a health and social services system, we want to build ladders to make sure that we're developing services that can get people back on track if they happen to fall off. And we can only do that if we really understand the role of trauma and adversity and make sure our services are such that people can tap into them. So we have to somehow engage people into services, relationships with us and their own health um, in a way that maybe we haven't thought of before. So trauma-informed care basically takes into account the impact of this toxic stress on how people see the world, that hypervigilance slide, how they interpret cues, including us and our facial expressions and the things we do and say, and what they feel they need to do in order to keep themselves and their families safe, including sometimes from the very systems that are trying to serve them. 
So this next couple of slides are just sort of some practical ideas, some practical ways to think about how to implement. Now you're all experts in the neurobiology of exposure to toxic stress during childhood. How do you think, you know, how do you actually implement that? Well, it turns out there is some literature on that. And we know that um, there is something in our humanness that relies very heavily on first impressions. Those first impressions actually make quite an imprint in our brain. And so when you think about some of it, and I don't know if any of you can now picture where people first come to meet you, kind of what the physical plant looks like, who are the first people they meet, um, you know, who, who are the, you know, are they met with, you know, a warm blanket and a hug, or are they met with forms to fill out, those kinds of things start to matter when you're talking about somebody who is very easily triggered. Um, and so those first impressions are, um, turns out, really super important. And you can get away with a lot after the first impression if the first impression has been good. So if you actually invest a little bit in making it pretty and making sure you have a very well-trained whoever greets the person, and you spend five minutes on the warm blanket and a hug before you hand out forms, it turns out that, that you get that back in all sorts of ways later on. I also want to note on physical environments, been a ton of research on this, mostly in schools, um, about how, and also a little bit in hospitals, about how our physical um, environments have a huge impact on how our brain works and how well we think. And it turns out that ACEs, this is kind of interesting, have much less impact on kids who have natural environments to run around in. Somehow those natural environments build resilience. But it's true for us too. I mean, we're at our best when we have natural light, which we don't hear. Um, plants, water, those sorts of things. And sometimes those things are very culturally specific, but there are also some things that are um, pretty common to all human beings. I also want to talk just for a second about our own selves. Because it turns out we have these little parts of our brain, they're lo located right here, which is why I'm putting my hand up, called mirror neurons. And this is kind of fun because mirror neurons were only just discovered in the late 1990s. I think it's amazing that there are still things in our bodies that are being discovered. That just kind of tickles me for some reason. Anyway, the mirror neurons are kind of amazing because it means that if I am connected to you, if I have a little bit of a relationship with you, and something happens to you, uh, my brain interprets it as having happened to me. And I know you probably all have this experience, maybe with your kid or your partner or a really close friend, where you actually feel their pain, certainly their emotional pain, but sometimes you can even feel their physical pain. So it turns out that our mirror neurons are probably a huge part of our ability to have empathy with people. And so sometimes um, that works really well for us, obviously, in forging relationships. But sometimes it gets sort of hard, doesn't it? If you get too connected to a family or a client or a child or something that's going through a really hard time, I mean, that's a recipe for burnout in um, the kind of work that you all do. So there are some things you can do to get yourself, your brain sort of re-equilibrated. One of them is a little trick I played on you at the very beginning of this, where I just asked you to think inward and then think outward. So you thought inward by saying, hmm, what percent of my brain is here and not here? And then when I asked you to put it into words, I actually brought you all right into the room. And in that moment, if I could have scanned your brains, even though you thought 40% of your brain was somewhere else, in that instant, you were all fully present here. And so I, you know, I've gotten good at that little trick because I do it a lot, but you can do it to yourselves too. You can figure out how to train your brain to come back um, using mindfulness methods or sometimes people use certain breathing, sometimes bringing your own heart rate down um, can change the way you think. So all of these things you do naturally, but what, I'm, what part of being trauma informed is that you don't count on doing them naturally, you do them intentionally. So I'm gonna go back to this slide for a minute because it was sort of a depressing slide and I didn't wanna leave it that way. So, um, there, so when you look at this, you think, well, what can we do about that? And it turns out that there are all sorts of things we can do about that. 
And you all probably do some of them all the time unconsciously. What I want you to do is become conscious of what you're doing and then be, get really good at it. So the first thing we gotta do in all of our systems, health systems, social systems, is on this side of the slide, we have to get rid of the cat hair. We have to stop triggering people's amygdalas in the first place. And probably if I give you 10 minutes right now and ask you to write down all the cat hair in your system, you could probably give me quite a list. I could certainly give you a list from the CCO health side. So, but we have to do that. We have to understand that the people that we're trying to serve have a whole bunch of um, allostatic load in their histories and in their childhoods that makes their amygdalas particularly um, kind of tricky, and we have to stop triggering them. So we have to get rid of the cat hair. So good vacuum, let's start with that. And then on the other side of the equation, some of you might have thought, well, gosh, if that amygdala is so much of a problem, could we put a lid on it? And it turns out that you can, and in some of the medications that my profession um, prescribes, antipsychotics, a couple of benzodiazepines, actually do dampen down the amygdala. And you might think, well, that would be a good thing. That would help people feel better. But it, you know, really, if right now, if I did a quick poll and I said, do you want me to mess with your amygdalas? Anybody, anybody, anybody interested in having that happen? The amygdala is what keeps you alive. I mean, it tells you when there's danger. And so you take people, maybe some of the people at least that we serve, who live in some sort of dicey situation sometimes, and have some, um, you know, maybe unsafe neighborhoods they live in and so forth. I don't want to mess with their amygdalas. I want them to be able to have their threat system working properly. So I don't really like that option of shutting down the amygdala. But those upper two arrows, the point of the hippocampus and the cortex, I just want to give you a little bit of hope. Um, in laboratory settings, it turns out that certain kinds of interactions where you're purposefully engaging the person's thinking brain and their hippocampus by reassuring them of safety and by giving them choices to make and those sorts of things that engage those parts of the brain, you can get those parts of the brain to look normal or look fully developed. So that's the good news, that even if you've got the situation, through very particular kinds of interactions, giving people choices, putting them in control of their own lives, having them make a lot of use. It's like taking your brain to the gym, taking that cortex to the gym and working it out and pushing it to think, 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 without relying on that emotional fight, flight, freeze center can get that part of the brain to behave as we would normally expect it to. And same thing with the hippocampus. So just think, you could be healing a person in every interaction you have with them if you can just engage that thinking part of their brain um, in a consistent way. So um, just I just want you to, you know, next time you're um, in your offices or maybe having a team meeting or something, just sort of contemplate, well, what signals safety so people's amygdalas aren't being fired in my environment? What could we do to signal that this is safe? To say to that hippocampus, you know, this is a good place, these are good people, um, that this is gonna be a good situation. What are some of the universal triggers? What's the cat hair and what do we need to get rid of? What's it, what is signaling danger in our, what's, What's the cat hair that's gonna cause people to not wanna engage and, and react? So this slide is just sort of meant to, you know, for you to take home with you and, and wonder to yourselves, well, what could we do in our environment with our teams or with my own darn self that would make this be different? Well, what is required? I'm gonna read this slide. So here's what we need to do. Have secure, reasonably healthy adults with good emotional management skills, with intellectual and emotional intelligence, able to actively teach and be role models, be consistently empathetic and patient, able to endure intense emotional labor, <laughs> self-discipline, self-control, and never abuse power. Huh. Right. There we go. That's what we need to do. That's who we need to be. So healthy staff, people who are good at this, do these things. They instead of labeling the person with one of those diagnoses from the DSM statistical manual that my profession invented 
Sorry about that. Um, they reinterpret difficult behavior through the lens of trauma exposure. They say, hmm, I wonder what happened. I wonder what coping skill this is that I'm seeing. And I wonder why it was triggered now. Something in the environment has set this person up. I wonder what. Um, and I wonder if that we could make that different, be different. Listen, really listen. That's what healthy staff do. Avoid overreacting. You know those mirror neurons I told you about? Well, the people you're serving have them too. And when you are heightened up, if you're amped up, even if it has nothing to do with the person sitting in front of you, maybe it has to do with the person you just saw, or maybe it has to do with something at home, that we are very tuned into each other's um, bodies through those mirror neurons. So um, collecting ourselves and um, being calm in our own selves is a huge asset to being trauma-informed. Avoid power struggles whenever you can. So don't try to sit on moral principle, but instead say, yeah, okay. Lean into service. It's sometimes the hardest thing to do when you're fighting with someone, but it's really important to help them get back into the thinking part of their brain. Figure out what was the trigger here? What was the trigger and how can we both learn from that? So valuable to know your triggers. Another fun exercise, fun exercise to do. I'm a psychiatrist, so I think really strange things are fun. <laughs> um, but a fun exercise to do is to take a minute and say, what are my triggers? What triggers me? Who are the kinds of clients that trigger me and why? But is it a raised voice? Is it an angry man? Is it um, somebody who's rejected my 20th offer of help? What are my triggers, and what do I look like when I'm triggered? You know, I get really, my kids would tell you, I get, mom gets really quiet. It's not good when mom's really quiet. So I don't know what you guys look like when you're triggered, but your clients would be able, and your coworkers would be able to say, oh, this is what you look like when you're triggered. <laughs> so what a valuable thing to know about yourself, and if you, the people you're working with can start to learn that about themselves too. It can help them be um, better family members and better parents. Whoops, we already did that. So that's healthy staff. I also wanna have just one slide on healthy teams because we're in this together and how you experience your workplace is revealed in how your clients experience you. And so healthy teams, um, have an overt understanding among them that we're going to treat each other with respect, interest, patience, and kindness. Um, they have, they have uh, sophisticated conflict resolution skills, and they practice conflict resolution rather than letting things simmer. Because those simmering things really have a huge impact on you and your body and the way you're able to be in the, th the best thinking part of your brain. Healthy teams know that they're important and that their voices are important and they have a role in how their organizations and teams function. They're emotionally intelligent. They understand that sometimes their tone or their mood or their words or their humor or their whatever, fill in the blank, have an impact on each other. And they have built ways and rituals and practices in order to relieve stress and be together in that time, whether it's a you know, bowling every Wednesday night, or celebrating each other's birthdays in a regular way, or whatever. Healthy teams actually intentionally build rituals that everybody gets to participate in. So not just the, you know, day shift or whatever. So we often have our own stuff. And so mostly that's the point of this, is we have our own stuff. We all have our own stuff. I even have my own stuff. Shocking as that might be to you. Um, but, you know, we all have our own stuff. And when we bring it to consciousness and grapple with it, understand it, and are able to um, be emotionally regulated ourselves about that, then it's okay if we have our own stuff. But if we don't do those things, then our own stuff starts to color how we view the world. Just like that hypervigilance glasses tend to color how people see the world. And we might start to perceive what people are doing as a direct insult to us. We might take things personally and so forth. And it makes us not understanding our own stuff, makes us potentially vulnerable to way more triggers. Um, so it's a great team and individual exercise to just say, hmm, what is my stuff and how does it get played out in the workplace and what can I do 
to make sure it doesn't disenfranchise, doesn't become cat hair. So this is sort of a summary slide. Um, a, a really good, so this is the, this is the take home, right? So to be trauma informed is these things, both as a team and as you as an individual. If you can facilitate physiologic calm wherever you go, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. Anybody here know somebody like that? Oh, it's a baby! Oh, oh, oh. oh I like babies. <laughs> um, I can't look at her, I won't be able to finish. So, so uh, she's beautiful. So, um, so, does anybody know this person who exudes calm wherever they go? Yeah? Got a few people. You know who those people Well, become one of those people. Become one of those people that you just enter the room and everybody's heart rate goes, <laughs> It's all okay now. And what you're doing is tapping into everybody's collective hippocampuses. That's what you're doing, is you're, you are becoming a safe zone all by yourself. And that's sort of the epitome of trauma-informed. The next thing there is if you can't be that person, well, at least don't be the cat hair. Don't, um, avoid triggering people's fight, flight, freeze response. Now, so the flip side of my question, anybody in here know that person who just triggers people wherever? Oh, yeah. Oh, everybody knows that person. Yeah. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. And then the kind of middle ground between those two areas is, and, and I would say this is where I, you know, I've come, probably got the best skills is in this last bullet point, is, you know, get good at engaging people's thinking skills. So figure out how to, ask the provocative questions or make the kinds of observations that get people thinking. Because the thing is, if people are in the thinking part of their brain, if they're doing crosswords or sudokus or trying to figure out whether free will exists or whatever, they are much less likely to be able to be triggered, it turns out. So if you've got somebody in the thinking part of their brain, and you guys, the thing is, you all know that. You know it unconsciously or subconsciously, because have you ever noticed when you're working with somebody that you think, oh man, they're about to kind of, they're kind of on the edge, and what you do is you start to engage them about maybe what's in the newspaper today, or, you know, oh gosh, what did you do last night, or what do you think of this or that? Have you noticed how you do that? You do that naturally. What I'm encouraging you to think about doing is do that intentionally. So I'm about to wrap up here. This is Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. People will never forget how you made them feel. And that's because of your hippocampus. It is a very, very powerful part of your brain. And how you feel in the situation, whether you feel safe or not, lives on forever for somebody. And so that's what you're, uh, that's what you're up against here. Also, mostly I just love this graphic, so I had to find a slide to put it on. Like I said, we don't know a lot yet about resilience, but we obviously know it exists. And we know that a lot of people go through a lot of toxicity, a lot of allostatic load, and do really well. So we know that brains can be protected, we know they can be rewired, and we know they can heal. And it always happens in the context of our interactions with each other. So I saw this uh, recently, and I've just added it to my um, slide presentations, because I thought, you know, we've got to learn to be trauma-informed with our own darn selves, too. So this is Dear Human, you've got it all wrong. You didn't come here to master unconditional love. That's where you came from and where you'll return. You came here to learn personal love, universal love, messy love, sweaty love, crazy love, broken love, whole love, infused with divinity, lived through the grace of stumbling, demonstrated through the beauty of messing up. Often, you didn't come here to be perfect, you already are. You came here to be gorgeously human, flawed and fabulous, and then to rise again into remembering. Now it's true for the people we serve, and it's true for you too. So I'm going to end with this one, quote by Ricky Lee Jones, you never know when you're making a memory. And that's just true, it's true with each other, and it's true with the people that you're serving.
So with that, I'm going to stop. We have just a few minutes for questions, which I welcome. And uh, thanks very much for your attention.